Thank you, Kathy, and good afternoon here from New York City. It's December 12th, and I'm thrilled to be with you. Uh, we have a terrific program ahead. This will be uh, my first and last program in December. We'll get to that in a moment because we're going to have a bit of adjustment on our schedule as we move closer toward the end of the year and bridge into 2024. So hold that thought. We will uh, provide you with updates at the end of the program. But before we move swiftly into the heart of the holiday season, we've got plenty to cover today. So if Kathy, you could please move to the next slide, I will walk everybody through. So I will be uh, spending a minute with you now, and then I'll come back at the uh, close of the program. In between, Adam Astraleo, uh, former co-host of the program, is back and uh, Adam will be addressing settlement agreement rules and general obligations law. There's been some changes there that are uh, recent, and Adam will bring the group up to speed. Tom Iran uh, is out of Syracuse as well, like Adam, and uh, he'll be covering NLRB uh, matters in specific uh, out of the Tesla decision and the various implications that emanate Aaron Tercello from Buffalo will be uh, staying on the NLRB theme and she'll address a uh, general counsel memo concerning Chemex. And um, then we will shift um, elsewhere down the hall in Buffalo. Uh, we'll have uh, Victoria Okrzewski, who is an attorney trainee who will be supervised by me as well. Um, it's Important to note that uh, Mario Ayub, who's been on the program many times as well, contributed to this uh, program preparation. Um, and so what Victoria will be covering is healthcare and cybersecurity, an area that, of course, I care a whole lot about. And we want to make sure that uh, this audience has a chance to hear what's new in that space. As I alluded, we'll be uh, touching on the holiday schedule um, as we close out here later today. But let's get to it. Adam is ready. We look forward to hearing from him. Adam, welcome back. Very glad that uh, you've decided to spend a minute with uh, the audience. I know everyone misses you and it's good to see you again. Gabe, thank you so much. And it's, it is great to be back with everyone today. Um, given that a large part of my practice involves employment discrimination claims and representing employers in those claims, I thought it would be uh, helpful if I went over some recent changes to general obligations law, section 336, which deals with settlement agreements. So if we could, Kathy, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay. So uh, if you remember back in 2018, uh, the New York State Legislature passed a law, New York State General Obligations Law, Section 5-336, which limited or uh, restricted the ways in which confidentiality provisions could be used in settlement agreements. So in general, what General Obligations Law does, it applies to settlement agreements relating to any claim involving discrimination, harassment, or retaliation in violation of laws prohibiting discrimination, harassment, or retaliation. I've bolded and underlined the harassment or retaliation language because those are some of the amendments that were just enacted uh, on November 17th of this year. So what it does is it prohibits any, uh, including any term or condition that would prevent the disclosure of the underlying facts and circumstances to the claim, unless the condition of confidentiality is the complainant's preference. So a couple of notes here. One, this law isn't going to apply to a standard separation agreement. So if you're separating uh, from employment with one of your employees, you want to present them with a separation agreement, this doesn't apply. It only applies where there's a claim involving discrimination, harassment, or retaliation. So claims can come in a couple of different forms. I'm sure all of you have received letters from attorneys from time to time saying, you discriminated against my client in such and such a way. That would be a claim. If you received a complaint from the EEOC or the New York State Division of Human Rights, that would be a claim. If you received a lawsuit, that would be a claim. So in those circumstances, this law would apply. The second thing to note here is that um, this does not apply uh, to confidentiality provisions that only deal with the terms of the settlement. So it's an important distinction to make, to make. Confidentiality of the facts underlying the claim are one thing. 
That's what's implicated by this statute. Confidentiality of the terms of the settlement, totally different. The statute isn't implicated. So those two things are important to point out. Next slide, please, Kathy. So uh, the conditions of when you want to have uh, a confidentiality provision included in a settlement agreement, you, it, first of all, it has to be in writing. According to state guidance, that means a separate agreement. So if you've worked with me on a settlement agreement before and you want to include this confidentiality term, you'll know that we have our standard separation agreement or settlement agreement, but then we also have the separate confidentiality agreement as per this law. Under the old version of the statute, the complainant had to be given 21 days to consider the term of confidentiality. That has been changed with the amendment to the law. So now we can give up to 21 days, meaning the complainant can sign the confidentiality agreement within 21 days. You don't have to wait the full 21 anymore. So that's a positive change that this new legislation incorporated. Uh, another condition is that the complainant can revoke the agreement within seven days of execution and that the confidentiality term would be void if it restricts the complainant from testifying, initiating, or providing information to uh, federal, state, or state agencies, uh, or if it prohibits the individual from filing or disclosing facts necessary to get public benefits. So those are a couple of other conditions. Next slide, please. The last and probably most significant change that this new uh, statute, the new amendment to the law put in effect was that the release of claims, which is what you want, the, that's your whole goal in having the employee sign the settlement agreement is you want a release. So the release of claims would be unenforceable if the agreement requires the complainant to pay liquidated damages for a violation of the non-disclosure or non-disparagement clauses requires the complainant to forfeit all or part of the consideration for violation of a non-disclosure or non-disparagement clause, or if it contains or requires any affirmative statement, assertion, or disclaimer by the complainant that they were not subject to unlawful discrimination or retaliation. So these are very important changes because a lot of employers use these terms or have used these terms in settlement agreements, myself included. So we have to be careful that moving forward, if we're entering into a settlement agreement, these terms cannot be included or else the release is going to be ineffective. Next slide, please. Just in conclusion, a couple of miscellaneous notes uh, to be aware of. First of all, the limitations found in the general obligations law section that we were just talking about are also found for some reason in New York's civil practice law and rules. The terms are almost identical, but the CPLR section have not yet been updated or have not been updated. I, I only point that out uh, to, to say that the CPLR section has not been updated, but we are confident that the amendments that are found in the gen general obligations law will apply. Another miscellaneous note is that employers can initiate the process of confidentiality by suggesting that term, so long as you follow what the law says. So you have to have the two agreements, you have to give them up to 21 days, you have to give them seven days to revoke. So as long as you follow that process, you as the employer can initiate. Um, and the final note is, as I've said a couple of times here, two agreements are required. One, memorializing the preference of confidentiality and two, dealing with uh, any of the other terms uh, of the settlement that you want to deal with. So uh, I know that's a lot, uh, but I wanted to cover uh, those updates because I think they're relevant for all of our clients who deal with discrimination or retaliation claims. And Gabe has, is before I, before I transition back to Gabe, uh, he's been kind enough to allow me to plug our HR Bootcamp for Healthcare Employer series that we are currently in the middle of. Uh, the second installment of that series will be this Thursday. It's for 45 minutes at noon. This, this session, we're going to cover hiring and staffing issues, including clinical staffing plans, mandatory overtime, and avoiding disc discrimination claims in hiring. If you want to register, there's still space. Uh, I will be doing it along with one of my colleagues, Pete Jones, 
hopefully it will be an informative dialogue for you, uh, for those of you in the healthcare industry. So you can register by clicking on the link here. I know that uh, we post this presentation every Wednesday, so you can do that uh, through our website as well. Thank you, Gabe. Adam, thank you. I wanted to give you a chance to answer a question that came through the chat. Sure. So does this apply retroactively? What do you no. think? The answer is no. Uh, the statute says, or the amendments state that they apply going forward from the date that they went into effect, which was November, 7th, November 17th of this year, moving forward. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying that. And good luck with the program later this week. And again, thank you for coming on today. It's good to have you back. Thanks, Gabe. Great to see you all. All right. And so we'll move then to our next presenter, who's Tom Iran. And Tom, of course, is a leader in our Syracuse office. And I wanted to remind you that, you know, you've seen Tom many times over and uh, he is the chair of the firm's labor and employment uh, department. And um, he is someone who has in many respects been behind this program since its start. Tom had intended to be with us live today, but unfortunately something uh, came up. And so we're gonna do something a little bit different. Uh, Tom pre-recorded comments which uh, Kathy is about to play. And we'll of course get questions back to Tom after you are all able to screen what Tom has to say. And uh, then we'll move on with the remainder of our live program. So Kathy, if you could please queue up uh, Tom, there he is. Terrific, let's go right ahead, thanks. Good afternoon. Um, I, I had been on the agenda um, for today's session but I got called into a mediation by a federal mediator on an ongoing labor dispute. Um, so we decided to pre-record my presentation. Hopefully it goes well. I've presented uh, on our webinar um, several times over the course of this year on developments advanced by the National Labor Relations Board affecting private sector employers, and particularly the board's process of um, or decisions that have expanded the rights of employees and unions and uh, limited uh, employers. And I'm here to report on a development um, involving Tesla uh, that moves in a different direction. And this is a decision by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals striking down the board's um, decision and order impacting Tesla's uh, uniform policy. So specifically at a manufacturing facility in, in Texas, Tesla had a policy in the assembly um, department that the rank and file employees were issued uh, black t-shirts uh, and it had uh, two justifications for the uniforms that it gave to its employees. The first was that literally the paint was not fully dry on the vehicles, paint had not fully cured and uh, buttons and pins and zippers could and in fact did damage the the um, surface of some vehicles and so tesla uh, prohibited uh, those on the assembly floor and the second uh, point was that they gave different color t-shirts to different folks so the assembly uh, employees had black t-shirts and the quality uh, control inspectors had white t-shirts and the supervisors had t-shirts in a different color. So that was, uh, it made it easy for individuals to know what function the particular employees were servicing. The United Auto Workers was, was attempting to um, organize the plant and they issued t-shirts to their employees or to their supporters to wear. And Tesla uh, advised those employees that uh, that was a violation of the uniform policy, sent them home and subject, uh, to, subjected them to potential discipline if they didn't follow the uniform. And, and it's significant here that part of Tesla's uniform policy was that you could put stickers on their uniforms. You couldn't have pins or buttons, but you could have stickers, any number of stickers with any message, including union messages. Um, nonetheless, the labor board uh, on complaint from the United Auto Workers found that it was that Tesla's policy was unlawful. And what was significant here was that the board said this uniform policy, in fact, any uniform policy, is subject to our standard of 
any limitation, any restriction on union insignia is subject to review under a special circumstances test, that the employer would have to show special circumstances to impose a restriction. Now, the uh, dissenting board members and the court easily recharacterize that ruling as all uniform policies are presumptively unlawful. In other words, the burden is on the employer to prove that it had a substantial business justification for a uniform policy. We've had some experience with this um, issue of special circumstances in the context of union insignias. We know that as a general rule, uh, the board has uh, allowed union insignias except in special circumstances, and that is a very limited uh, class of cases. Sort of the, the classic example is that a hospital could prohibit union insignias on uniforms in patient care areas because of the concern that, that it might impact patient care. But, but it's that narrow a category um, that was now being applied across the board for all uniform policies. Tesla took this case up on appeal and the uh, uh, appellate um, court for the fifth um, circuit down in Texas, Louisiana area, rejected the board's conclusion and, and, and not just rejected it, but uh, very strongly stated the board uh, was irrational and arbitrary in its holding. And, and the court uh, had uh, good reason to come to that conclusion. Um, for more than 80 years, we've been living with a Supreme Court case involving a company called Republic Aviation, which was the balancing of employer interests in running its business and employee slash union interests in uh, union organizing and engaging in concerted protected activity. And the court said there has to be a balancing. And, and the famous phrase that it used is a, a um, as little destruction of one right as is necessary to maintain the other. And the Tesla case uh, proves a very um, strong example. The company had legitimate justifications for the um, restrictions for the uniform code that it established both in terms of visual inspection of the uh, identification of the employees and, and potential damage to the vehicles. And it had not been a complete 100% prohibition against union insignia. It had been uh, much more limited and allowed stickers on the uniforms. And the court said that was a very reasonable um, balancing of the employee interests and the employer interests. And, and refused to enforce the board's order. Uh, and again, because the board had effectively rendered all uh, uniform policies presumptively unlawful, the court said um, it had exceeded its authority. It acted irrationally in the absence of some indication that Congress intended such a sweeping conclusion. The court was not willing to follow the board to that result. So some good news in the sense that even though the board is being very aggressive in this and many other areas, um, including as, as Aaron will talk um, uh, about either before or after this video presentation, there is some rationality. Uh, unfortunately, um, this decision is, does not change the law. Perhaps the Labor Board will pursue this case to the Supreme Court. We'll get a ruling that does finalize um, these legal principles. Um, but because this is a circuit court decision, the board is not required uh, to follow this result. And in fact, the board has a history of what's known as the non-acquiescence uh, principle, that um, it does not change its uh, thinking on national labor policy simply because one court of appeals uh, has rejected its approach. Now, this is more than a rejection. It's a, um, you know, strongly worded challenge to the board's thinking. 
and perhaps that will cause the board to pull back. I'm not entirely optimistic on that, but perhaps it will, or perhaps we'll see um, an appeal to the Supreme Court and get a resolution that is binding on us. For the time being, for those of you who have a uniform policy, um, we continue to deal with these concerns that the board has, has put in front of us, that even a policy that allows for some measure of, of union insignia has a potential risk that the board would find the policy unacceptable. And in light of the CMAC decision and other developments, uh, that continues to be very problematic. We will keep you. Um, we'll keep our eye on this and other board developments, and 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 be sure to um, inform our client base as as uh, the law develops. Um, thank you for your time this afternoon, and I'll turn it back over to Gabe. Well, thank you, Tom. I appreciate that you took the time to record that uh, in advance. And of course, if any of the audience members uh, has a question for Tom, just enter it in the Q&A box and we'll make sure to get it on to Tom. Let's stay with the NLRB theme and uh, we're going to shift over to Buffalo now where Aaron Torcello is back. Aaron, of course, has hosted this program, has presented on it uh, many, many times over and uh, is here to discuss um, the general counsel memo, memo excuse me, and uh, we look forward, Aaron, to hearing from you uh, and building on uh, the foundation that Tom provided in his comments of a moment ago. Aaron, the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you, Gabe, and thank you all for attending. Um, as Gabe mentioned, I have presented on this topic, um, the NLRB's CMEX decision that was issued back in early September, um, and we're talking about it again today. And uh, as Gabe alluded to, the general counsel for the National Labor Relations Board recently issued some guidance on this decision and how the um, general counsel's office intends to enforce the um, analysis under CMEX. So um, as I mentioned back in my September program, the NLRB CMEX decision overturned decades of precedent with regard to the union election process. For purposes of this presentation, I'm not going to go through the long history and overview of the decision that we went through back in September and which we uh, wrote about on our blog. Um, so if you have questions about this decision in general, I encourage you to go back on our website, uh, take a look at those materials or reach out to me or anyone else in the department for um, a larger explanation and discussion of this, this decision. But for purposes of today, I want to provide just a brief refresher of the holding in that decision and what we learned from the general counsel's that was general counsel's memo that was issued back in November. So as a very brief refresher, um, the National Labor Relations Board under the CMEX decision um, turned the election process on its head. And with this decision, um, implemented a process whereby a union can request recognition from an employer of a unit of that employer's employees. And the employer um, cannot just reject outright that request for recognition. It has an obligation to either recognize the union upon that um, uh, claim of majority support, or it can file what's known as an RM petition with the board. So essentially, the this decision really changed how unions can go about organizing employers. So when the when the decision came out, the board's decision came out, it left a number of questions about how this process was going to be implemented, what the some of the enforcement mechanisms were going to be coming out of the general counsel's office. And with this memo that was issued in November, we we received a few answers to some of our outstanding questions. So just as a very quick reminder, the general counsel for the National Labor Relations Board is the prosecutorial arm of the board. It is that portion of the board that decides what cases um, they believe there was a violation of the law and they, they prosecute those cases. So the general counsel is the head of that branch. So the general counsel uh, in this memo really outlined 
three aspects of what will happen upon a union claiming representation of a majority status. Um, at that point, the employer can either agree to recognize the union or it can promptly, and the board has defined promptly as within two weeks, file this RM petition um, with the National Labor Relations Board. And that petition would test the validity of the union's majority support, or the, the employer could challenge the appropriateness of the unit the union claims it represents or has majority support within. Or lastly, uh, the employer could await the process it processing of what's known as an RC petition, which is the petition a union would file with the board where it's seeking an election uh, to establish its majority support. Um, what's interesting about this is we, we generally knew that these would probably be the three avenues. The memo just supports that conclusion. But what's interesting is if an employer, upon request for recognition, does nothing, does not do any one of these three things, the general counsel memo made it clear that at the end of that two-week time period, if no action has been taken by the employer, the union could file an unfair labor practice, uh, which would probably be an 885 failure to bargain type of a charge, and the board could issue a bargaining order as a result of the employer's failure to act in any capacity upon that request for recognition within a two-week period of time. So it really underscores for us the importance of acting timely and quickly where there is a request for recognition. Relatedly, one of the issues that we had or, or concerns and thoughts that we had following the CMEX decision, initial decision in September was, well, who does the union have to present its request for recognition to? And the general counsel has, has indicated, has signaled that they are going to view a request very broadly. So essentially, the union can show that it's made a valid request where they have asked the an agent of the employer for recognition. So the agency test under board law is typically a common law agency test. And really all that the union would have to show is that that individual either directly or indirectly works on behalf or acts on behalf of the employer. So this could be a foreman. It could be a frontline manager or supervisor. It doesn't have to be the VP of HR. It doesn't have to be the CEO. It doesn't have to be the CFO. It could be anyone that, that the board has found could be an agent of the employer. So that makes it really important for employers to understand that these requests for recognition don't have to go to the top echelons of the employer don't have to go to the top echelons of even a facility within the organization. So long as that individual is an agent of the employer, the request for recognition will be legitimate and the time for response will start to run at that point in time. What's also interesting about this memo is that the, the general counsel has clarified um, and provided guidance on the fact that the Request for recognition doesn't have to be in any particular form. The general counsel uh, opined that the request can be written or verbal, and it can take many forms. So the guidance, if we can call it that, um, has really just uh, shown us that the board is going to view these requests for recognition as broadly as possible. To Tom's point in his in his presentation, a lot of what the board has done over the past 18 months, two years under Biden is really expand the opportunity for union and employees to um, to expand representation and to do so as seamlessly and as easily as possible. The last thing I want to highlight, and the memo is five to six pages long, and there's a lot of really nuanced information in there, but for purposes of what's important for you as employers to know on the front lines, the last thing I would mention is that where 
a, a union requests majority um, or says they have majority support and requests representation, um, the employer can, in response, ask for proof of majority support. But the general counsel has opined that the union need not show the employer its evidence of majority support. The general counsel instructed that the parties, the union and the employer, can engage a third party neutral, be it a mediator or some neutral party, to uh, inspect and review the union's uh, evidence of majority support. But the union does not have an obligation, at least in accordance with this memo or the position of the general counsel, is that the union does not have to show its evidence of majority support to the employer upon request. This puts an employers in a unique situation because you should also be aware that um, if you recognize a union that does not have majority support. Uh, so if it turns out, you know, a union says we've got majority support and an employer recognizes them, but they don't actually have majority support, um, that can be an unfair labor practice. An employee could file a charge saying that the employer recognized a union that did not have majority support, and that can be a violation of the National Labor Relations Act. So employers have to walk a very fine line here. Um, if they if they choose to voluntarily recognize or what their response will be upon a request for voluntary recognition. So our takeaways here are really twofold. First, we can, it is very clear from this memo that the general counsel intends to strictly enforce the standard that that was set out by the board in CMEX back in in September, and it will not shy away from issuing bargaining orders, um, either where an employer has not responded to a request for recognition or where they, there may have been an unfair labor practice committed um, following the request for recognition. But secondly, and this ties into the first takeaway, which is it is really important for you to to train your managers and your supervisors on what a request for recognition might look like, things for them to be aware of, um, what your process or procedure is going to be if you have a request for recognition. So it's really important that employers understand the role that your um, frontline supervisors and managers may have in these situations. So thank you for your time. Gabe, I'm going to turn it back to you. And if anyone has any questions, um, either reach out to me or your, you know, your favorite bond attorney. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, it's really helpful to hear more on CMEX in the uh, fashion that you described where you came in September and you gave uh, the group some you know, broad introduction. Here we are uh, living in a uh, you know, much uh, deeper world uh, where uh, we're all coming to terms with the implications. And uh, please come on back to the program um, if there are further updates in uh, the coming weeks. In the meanwhile, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to present. We appreciate it. And let me now shift to the final presenter for the day, who is Victoria. Um, Victoria uh, Okrzewski is uh, out of our Buffalo office as well. And it's important to note, though, that uh, Victoria is a trainee who uh, has been um, you know, with Bond as she uh, you know, begins her legal career. Um, and in the process of preparing for this presentation, she's consulted very closely with uh, Mario Ayub, who's not on the program today as well with me. Um, and uh, among the three of us uh, with Victoria providing um, the oration, as it were, uh, we'd like to share information uh, concerning what's new in healthcare and cybersecurity, because there's a lot that's been percolating. And Victoria, looking forward to hearing uh, your summary. And of course, uh, we'll monitor the questions that come in through the chat. So Victoria, welcome to the program. And thank you so much for taking the time to pull together the remarks you're about to present. Thanks, Gabe, for the introduction, and I'm happy to be here. So, Kathy, can you move to the next slide, please? So, starting out with some shocking statistics. So, healthcare entities are particularly vulnerable to cyber attacks due to their size, technological dependence, and vast amount of sensitive data they possess. According to the OCR, there have been there has been a 93% increase in data breaches from 
2018 to 2022. And during this year, there have been 536 data breaches that have been reported. And as a result of an attack, elective surgery, outpatient appointments, and other services can be suspended and emergency rooms can be shut down, which will be demonstrated through a case example I have on the next slide. And also during ransomware attacks in particular, the mortality rate for patients rises from 20 to 35%. So next slide, Kathy. Please. So on Thanksgiving, Ardent Health Services experienced a ransomware attack. It affected 30 of its hospitals and shut down several emergency rooms across at least three states. In response to the breach, it took its network offline, suspended access to the information technology applications for all its users. All non-urgent surgeries were canceled and will be rescheduled when their network is restored. And unfortunately, it had to divert patients requiring immediate care to other local hospitals. On December 6th, so roughly two weeks after the attack, its network was finally restored and its ERs reopened. Uh, next slide. So most recently, Fresenius uh, indicated that one of its U.S. subsidiaries, cardiovascular consultants, experienced a data breach. Uh, right now, there isn't too much public information available about this breach, but as a result, 500,000 medical records from its current and former patients and guarantors were compromised, as well as 200 staff members. And all these individuals lived across the U.S. and U.S. territories and other four countries. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so CISA actually indicated some guidelines that businesses or healthcare facilities can follow in order to mitigate or just have a better grasp on cyber attacks. So the first strategy they indicated was asset management and security. Basically, you can't secure what you can't see. So it's important that these facilities implement and maintain an inventory of their assets and as well as any security safeguards. So one in particular that CISA recommended was network segmentation, which basically you divide your network into smaller parts, which enables better control. And also in the event of a breach, it can prevent actors from moving laterally throughout the environment. Uh, the second one is, I identify management and device security. So kind of your basic safeguard your account, safeguard your network, and do your best efforts to prevent, protect sensitive data and PHI. And lastly, vulnerability patch and configuration management, which is the process of identifying, assessing, and reporting on managing and remediating, remediating any cyber vulnerabilities that could come up in your environment. Uh, next slide, please. So with the rise of the cyber attacks in the healthcare industry, it's important to pay attention to various regulations that are being proposed. So at the federal level, HHS actually published a um, concept paper outlining its cybersecurity strategy to enhance cyber resilience and protect patients' health information. There are four main goals of the paper. So the first is establishing a voluntary, voluntary cybersecurity goals for the healthcare industry. Uh, these goals will help clarify which cybersecurity practices to prioritize, and it's going to use input from the industry and include essential minimum goals, as well as encourage the encouragement to adopt other enhanced practices. Uh, the second is providing resources to incentivize and implement these cybersecurity practices. So with this goal, the HHS seeks to establish two programs, the first one being upfront investments. So helping low-resourced hospitals get on their feet and start implementing the cybersecurity program through funds and also an incentives program, so giving reimbursement to hospitals that do comply with these proposed regulations. And lastly, implementing an HHS-wide strategy to support greater enforcement and accountability. So this is HHS's way of proposing new cybersecurity requirements for hospitals through Medicare and Medicaid, and also the OCR is seeking to update 
uh, HIPAA during the upcoming spring to include new cybersecurity requirements. And lastly, expanding and maturing the one-stop shop within the HHS for, for healthcare sector cybersecurity. So basically they're seeking a more of, to help more effectively enable industry access to support and services that the federal government has to offer. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and also at the state level, so New York Governor Kathy Hochul just proposed cybersecurity regulations for hospitals throughout New York State. Um, so hospitals must implement minimum cybersecurity controls to safeguard patients' personal health information and avoid delays in the event of a breach. Some examples of the proposed requirements are each hospital must have a chief information security officer to enforce, review, and update policies and procedures in relation to cybersecurity. Um, each hospital must develop a cybersecurity program to include written policies, procedures, and other standards to safeguard the hospital's network and servers. And also hospitals must implement multi-factor authentication to access the hospital's internal networks. And in order to help businesses with compliance, the governor has allocated $500 million of the fiscal budget. And most recently, the proposed regulations were reviewed by the Public Health and Health Planning Council, and it was published in the state register on December 6th, and there's a public commenting period that will end on February 5th, 2024. And lastly, if adopted, the New York State hospitals will have one year to implement and comply with all of these requirements. Um, so just on a last note, kind of a takeaway. So given the increase in sophistication of techniques that threat actors are using to gain access to environments, it's important that the healthcare industry actually make an effort to invest in cybersecurity safeguards to protect its servers, as well as making it a priority to protect its patients' data as well. So Victoria, thank you so much for that presentation. We're really glad that you could be with us. And uh, we're going to be keeping track of both the federal activity as well as the state level activity. And uh, we're working on a written piece, uh, Victoria and I, along with Mario, uh, to get into some further depth around some of the issues that Victoria previewed here in today's presentation. So please look for that. Uh, it'll be out, uh, we think, within the next uh, few business days. And in the meanwhile, Victoria, thank you so much for coming on the program. And uh, please come on back uh, when there's something new to share. So Kathy, what I'll do is I'll move to um, some programming notes that I had mentioned at the top of the program that I wanted to make sure we had time to cover now. So the next program a week from today on December 19th that Kristen Smith will be hosting um, will be, like we did last year, a focus on the year in review. Um, what we thought worked well was a chance to really look holistically at everything that uh, has happened in the year that we think would be meaningful uh, for all of you to absorb and otherwise integrate. And uh, we're going to have uh, Pete Jones, who's presented, of course, on this program numerous times and has hosted Hannah Redman, another regular. Uh, the two of them will together uh, really be integrating that recap for all of you. And then we're going to be moving into business in 24. It's important, though, to note um, when we flip the calendar and move from 23 to 24, uh, we're cognizant of the fact that we're moving into a holiday season uh, where for uh, both uh, the 26th of December and the 2nd of January, um, with the way that Christmas and New Year's fall uh, this year, we thought it made most sense to take those two weeks off um, to make sure that all of you have uh, the space to enjoy your family, your loved ones, and the quiet of that period. And then we will come back in full force on January 9th. Uh, I'll be your host and we'll be looking at the year ahead, which will be approaching very much in the same way as that year in review that we'll have on the 19th. Uh, we're still working through the particulars of that January 9th program, but I look forward to bringing that to you along with uh, other guests who uh, will make sure to line up between now and then. And in the meanwhile, Keep tuning in. December 19th is our next program. I won't be back with you until 2024. So I wanted to wish all of you 
a very joyous new year, a very ha happy holiday season. I thank you for your commitment to this program. And I look forward to being with you as we flip into January. In the meanwhile, wishing you all a terrific afternoon. And thank you.